When my mother, who is 85, fell ill at Christmas, we all thought she was going to die. Suddenly she, who has never fallen, who has all her original joints, whose mind is sharp and clear, she who has been the steady force at the center of our family was faltering. We had just finished our traditional Christmas dinner at my parents' house in Massachusetts. Turkey, stuffing, mashed potatoes, gravy, lots of my mother's thick, smooth, homemade gravy, all served up on her flowered wedding china with a real silver. The table was simple and beautiful, the conversation perfect. We exchanged small gifts and caught up with each other. And that night, she fell ill. She spent five days in the hospital with pneumonia. I put my children, who are eight and 11, on a red eye, their first solo flight, to meet my husband in Seattle. I teared up as the gate agent came to take my boys through the door. My older son turned away with a stoic expression. My younger son grabbed his head with both hands. Mom, he said, don't cry, it's embarrassing. <laughs> I hugged them hard. There was everything to say and nothing new to say. Goodbye, I said. I love you. And I telegraphed it again, staring out into the rainy Boston night as the plane backed away from the jetway and turned to leave. Driving home, home to the bedroom with my high school books and sports trophies, I was suddenly different. Mother of children ready to fly on their own and daughter of a mother at the precipice of life. When I was in my 20s, a woman who worked near me in a big New York City building lost her mother. She was distraught, young and flip with a mother I took for granted. I asked how old her mother was. 99, she answered, and then as if reading my thoughts. But it doesn't matter how old they are, she said. You're never ready to lose your mother. And all these years later, I can see her face as it was when she said that to me. My mother has had a rich and spectacular life, a strong marriage, travel, meaningful work, a community of friends, access to ideas. Her children are adults, her grandchildren are thriving. She has the benefit of a mind that can still read three newspapers daily and, like a wizard, untangle the shifting alliances in the years of conflict in the Middle East, share sports trivia with my boys. Stop a raging political argument with compassionate commentary on struggling governments and suffering people. It has been such a good ride. And yet, and yet I am not ready to lose her. Not quite ready to acknowledge myself as an adult. Not quite ready to be a mother to my own children without my mother. Because no one else in the world delights in my children as much as she does. No one else reminds me the way she does that motherhood begins and ends with love. Most of all, I'm not quite ready to move the tangible connection to the past that I have through her into my growing bank of memories. She's my connection to a simpler, quieter world. Her mother. Her mother grew up in snowy Connecticut and remembered the sound of sleigh bells as a child. Sleigh bells on real sleighs pulled by horses, carrying people under heavy blankets to town for the day. I didn't know until I saw my mother sick that I cared about sleigh bells. She recovered this time. At home, I tucked her into bed, then boldly curled up next to her, the first time I've been in her bed since I was a child seeking refuge in a thunderstorm. She didn't mind. I felt her small body relax. I rubbed her back and shoulders, until she fell asleep, as she used to do for me when I was sick. Daughter to my mother, mother to my children, not quite ready to let go of either, everything still to say, nothing left to say. Goodbye in both directions, as my people pull away from the gate, moving slowly into the night. Goodbye, I love you. <laughs>